sent to the cities and counties in the Local Land Use Planning Act, which is section 6765 uh, Idaho Code, that you have to plan and zone. And when you zone, you have to do that in accordance with the comprehensive plan. So zooming fast forward to 1981, the Idaho Attorney General said, yeah, that law means what it says. There are actually two Attorney General opinions on this topic. They're available on the website, kccode.com. The Attorney General's office actually gave us the old documents that they don't even have on their website, so we could post them for you to look at. Um, in 1994, Kootenai County adopted a comprehensive plan. It had plans before that. I just don't have dates on them, so I'll be honest with you. I know that the county had plans before that. Um, and in 2006, they began a visioning process to update the plan. And just like people want to update plans in their own lives at critical moments, uh, the county needs to update its plans due to changing conditions every so often. So it did back in 2006. There was a firm called Keziah Watkins, some of you may know. Uh, we haven't worked with them, we don't know them personally, but we know that they started this process of developing a vision for the county by reaching out to people who live here and asking them what they thought. In 2007, the County Planning and Zoning Commission picked up the ball and ran with it for three hard years with 100 plus meetings out in the county uh, to figure out what the comprehensive plan should say. And in 2011, they brought us in to say, help us write a code uh, to implement this comprehensive plan. That was the result of a national search where all the top uh, planning and zoning firms uh, participated in that search. Uh, we competed against those top firms for the work. There was one firm from Spokane, there were no firms from Cuny County that applied for the job. Uh, and we were very honored to be selected among those groups uh, to, to do this project with the county. So our, our job is to work with the people of the county to develop a custom code for the county that reflects what the county is and how to implement the county's comp plan. So that's where we are in terms of background, the short history. Our purposes are the state code says that we have to zone in accordance with the plan, so we need to implement that plan. But if I say I want apple pie for dessert, I might have 500 recipes for apple pie. And 300 of them might have stuff I'm allergic to, and 150 of them may have stuff I really hate. And so I need to find the 50 recipes that will work and then choose a couple of those. And that's really what we're doing. We're trying to find the code provisions that will work with the shared values of the people that live here to implement the plan that they say that they want. Because there's a lot of different ways to, to do it, we're going to find the ways that work. Okay, so that's why we iterate and work with the public to try to get a code that reflects their values. Uh, create a one-stop shop for what's now included about 30 development ordinances. Some of you have experience trying to get development approvals in the county. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not. But if you really want to know what you can do on land, you have to look at about 30 different ordinances just to make sure that you don't get that gotcha moment that there was some law somewhere else that you didn't see. Uh, that gotcha moment can be really costly and frustrating. Delay, uh, which of course if you're doing a big project is a very good deal. Uh, ensuring the internal consistency to avoid the gotcha scenario of confusion. It's a personal mission of mine and all the work I do because I represented private sector clients for six years. I get it when you find that gotcha moment, how hard that can be, particularly if you have a land deal on the line uh, and the approval, the timing of the approval is essential to getting the job done. We want to support the reasonable expectations of peace and quiet in residential neighborhoods. The first purpose of zoning under the Idaho Code 676508, I think it is, is protect private property rights while also allowing for other uses like manufactured housing parks. That's kind of an odd statement, but what it means is um, you don't want to introduce uses next to each other that cause neighbor-on-neighbor -neighbor conflicts that ruin the quality of life. And so the private property rights we're talking about are the rights that somebody establishes by building a home on their property and enjoying the peace and quiet enjoyment of that lot. And that's where we are. That's what we're trying to start with as the initial proposition. From there, there's protecting natural resources. So about five out of 12, I think, of the purposes are have natural resource consequences. We want to protect natural resources while supporting the economic use of properties. So if you can get good economic use of your property and protect natural resources, that's a win-win. We want to provide opportunities and not get in the way of the good deeds. A lot of codes get in the way. Making procedures more streamlined and more fair is a critical element of the project. So more gratuitous animation going into the proposed changes and basis for reform and the changes. So right now, this is what you have in the current code. These zoning districts, agriculture, agriculture, suburban, restricted residential, commercial, light industrial, industrial, mining, rural, high density residential, PUD, and airport. Take a right. Other side. In the proposed code, we have one less district. Now we may end up adding one more, and I'll tell you, but we're pretty comparable in terms of the number of districts. The difference is these districts mean something in the context of what it is that Kootenai County actually is. We have a scenic district, which scenic. applies to that vast array of federal lands and state lands to the east side of the county uh, that are scenic and that are in public ownership anyway. So this is a placeholder for those on the zoning map, so you know what's not privately held. 
Working lands large are the larger farm areas that are typically in 40 acre or larger parcels, not always, but typically. Working lands general is those areas of working lands, farms, forests, mines, that are in 20 acre uh, uh, or more uh, configuration. Countryside, there's a big pattern across the north end of the county in 10 acre square lots. That, in our view, is a countryside. You're going to see more buildings in that area than in a rural, a truly rural environment. It's a transition from farming areas to residential areas. One unit for 10 acres is generally what you're seeing. We have a district for that. You don't have a district that for that now. You have that, but you don't have a district for it. Um, we have a state residential, which is very comparable to your rural district. Right now, it's a five-acre district, except that it's a residential district. And I would submit to you that a large swath of what is currently rural in your zoning code is actually residential neighborhoods. And that's something that uh, we have brought forward in this code as a state residential. Suburban residential is a lot more like what we call restricted residential. Except your restricted residential allows uh, 5.2 units per acre. So that basically means for every, uh, every acre, you could probably get five houses, 0.2 you would use for streets. So five houses per acre, those of you who live on the countryside uh, can appreciate what that means when you introduce that in the countryside. If you live in Post Falls or something like that, Post Falls is actually less dense than that zoning district would allow uh, on the whole. That's pretty significant. So, uh, and then you have uh, an established neighborhoods district, some of you may have heard of. The established neighborhoods district is about protecting neighborhoods that are already there and ensuring that the owners in those neighborhoods aren't harassed by nonconformities, uh, by not being able to rebuild because their house is in the wrong location, whatever. And we'll show you how the established neighborhoods district will likely benefit most of you in this room if you live in the unincorporated county. I want to pause and ask you how many people live in the unincorporated area of Cuny County as opposed to an incorporated municipality. Okay, very good. If you live in Post Falls or Coeur d'Alene or Hayden or uh, another incorporated place, Rathrow, Apple, if you live inside the city, this has no effect on your house. You don't have any jurisdiction in the county over what the city well, does. If you're interested in your city zoning, you're going to have to talk to City Hall and yes. the city that you live in. The county zoning only applies outside of cities, and it's a very important consideration. Um, the commercial district is very much like your existing commercial district. The industrial district combines your existing industrial and light industrial districts. Uh, we didn't see any differentiation between the two that meant very much. And then planned regional development would be a way to build sort of new places on very large tracks through a very public planning process. So why would we take an existing code and scrap it and start over? We'll, do, we'll tell you district by district really quick. The existing agriculture district does not allow any subdivision. If your property is owned ag, anybody's owned ag, then your property is not allowed to be subdivided under the existing code. Does that make sense? You think it does make sense that you shouldn't be able to cut your land in two? No, I want to be able to cut my land. Right. So under the existing code, if you're zoned ag, you can't subdivide. We think, and our committee thinks, that's too restrictive. But if you could subdivide right now, that district would go down as far as five acre lots which is too fragmented for agriculture on the whole. Now that doesn't mean that your land, your personal land, would stay agriculture or five acre or 40 acre or whatever. We'll talk about that tonight. But this district doesn't work very well. Because if I have 600 acres on that, I get one house on 600 acres. What's cool about that? You could go to 40s, nobody gets hurt. So we proposed a 40 acre district to maintain agriculture, but to allow a whole lot more flexibility for a large landowner than the existing district. This district is scrapped. It's working lands large, working lands general, some countryside. Yeah. Todd, does open range affect, does that come to effect if you're in a, an area that the open range laws are still active and you're, you're zoned agriculture, does that have anything to do with what's coming up? I don't think so. I think this is more about where the property lines are. No, uh, if you're are you familiar with the open range laws? I, I am about how cattle and, and other livestock can range across different areas and whatever. Right. Um, yeah, I, I don't think that the zoning is really going to have much effect in terms of those things. Well, Will, I mean, if I got a, a millionaire that comes in next to my place and decides to build a million dollar house next to my ranch, and if my cows get out and go over and eat his little petunias or whatever <laughs> the hell they are, and he's not aware that there's an open range district between the corridor of 41 and 95, you know, legally he doesn't have a ground to stand on in right. the first place. Right. So that's my question. Being 
are you changed in the process of changing all that? Are we going to do away with open no. range? Huh? Open range is a state law. That's right. The county is subordinate to state law. Right. Nothing the county can do can change state law. Okay. And in fact, the county has to zone because state law says you have to zone. Well, uh, and so, so the herd districts and those, there's a whole different process to go through. It's for range. Kind of for range, open range and those. Okay. And this does not affect where those open range and herd districts are. Uh, um, they will still stay where they are. No okay. The problem is, Commissioner, you have people I, I in, our, in our EN, I guess it's an EN now, that have bought fives and tens and twenties, and I'm talking to people with a lot of money, spending a lot of money on houses, and if one of my horses or one of my cows get out and go on their property, you know, next thing you know, you're in court, and you know, they end up losing in the first place because they bought into an area that is open range. That's right. It's been state law since the 1800s. It right. might be, Mr. Kramer, that there could be, we're, we're talking about actually, we have these posters, and these posters might be hung you know, in this building, so people that come in will see. And it might be a good idea to just have a poster for people that go to get a building permit to see that. But yeah. beyond that, the state laws are what they are. Okay. And we're not going to go against the state law. Right. That's the what existing we're rural district provides too little predictability for such a large area. It's way too many conditional uses that are not rural. It's internal inconsistencies about what's allowable are remarkable. And it invites protests and litigation that you can read the recent newspaper articles and see the types of stuff that comes up. And the bottom line is it allows seven million five acre lots which aren't rural. I've said in certain locations five acre lots are bad. I'm on record for that and I, I stand by that. But in certain locations five acre lots are okay. But they're not rural, let's be honest about it. It's something else. And so I just wanted to share with you because I think this is a very important point. This is your zoning map. And I'm not doing this this year, this is it. This color is rural, okay? So if you got a five acre lot in this area in a residential neighborhood, and you expect that your residential neighborhood is gonna stay a residential neighborhood, let me just list to you a couple of conditional uses that can be allowed in that neighborhood. Gun club and rifle range, automobile wrecking yard, junkyard, sawmill, shingler, plain mill, woodworking plant, airport, racetrack, explosive storage and manufacturing, sanitary landfill, and restricted service mine. Conditional uses. What's restricted so, service mine? I don't know. It's not defined. What's wrong with that? It's not defined. I don't know. It's an argument. It invites arguments. It's ambiguous. There are some standards around them, but the bottom line of the conditional use is you go to a public hearing. If there are 400 people in the room saying, hell no, they could be granted. You don't know. Good. It's a chance that you take living in a rural district. And so everybody can see this poster. <clears throat> Somebody was taking a video. This is the poster, okay? Rural district. All of this orange. Explosives, manufacturing, and storage. <clears throat> All right, so in a residential district, we don't expect to have explosives manufacturing and storage next door. We have an estate residential district for those five acre lots. We have working lands for those farms. These are non-rural leases. We have industrial districts for explosive manufacturing and storage. We have uh, industrial districts and working lands districts to make sure that surface mining in whatever form it takes is done appropriately and sensitively with respect to the people that are next door. That's what we're talking about. There's a need for reform, and that is the best illustration of that need, if nothing else. And some of you are personally involved in land use conflicts that I can't even imagine how what a nightmare that must be. Existing residential, so more regulation. Uh, restricted residential and high density residential are probably too dense. This county doesn't provide services to the municipal level. They have districts that do all this stuff. The districts are telling us the highway districts. We don't, we don't want new roads. We, it was having a hard time keeping up with what we had. Introducing uh, five units per acre density, 14 and a half units per density, uh, per acre density in some of these areas, it doesn't make any sense. These are really out of step with what people are actually doing. The very few locations in, in the county unincorporated that are zoned age high density residential are trailer parks that are less than 14 and a half. We can zone for trailer parks and not worry about it, but this high density residential is too much. Five units per acre is more than people can actually get, so it sets up an unreasonable expectation. Our most dense district for residential is three units per acre, which is pretty darn dense too. It's probably about where Post Falls would average, about three units per acre, would be my guess. Um, and that's just a guess, so don't quote me as saying it as a fact. 
Mining like industrial and airport districts are probably not needed. You can do these things in industrial districts. You can do mining sensitively, relatively sensitively, in a working lands district, but do it in a way where you're buffering it and making sure that your hours of operation are not, you know, 24 7, seven days a week, that kind of stuff. We would put conditions like that into, um, into the code to make sure that those things are operating in ways that don't hurt people. Um, and so those districts are probably not needed, so we got rid of them. We revised the industrial and working lands districts to make up for the differences, to make sure land uses are still going to be allowed, uh, but that they're allowed in locations that are appropriate or constrained in ways that are appropriate with conditions, to make sure that they're not making people crazy with the, with the noise or the dust or the lighting or whatever, that they operate in ways that are sensitive to their rural landscape. Flexibility that's currently offered by plan unit development districts. And by plan unit development, those are developments that all the rules are negotiated in a public hearing, like Gaza Ranch and Black Rock and things like that, where they just negotiate all the designs. Um, you can do that stuff with great design in a straight code. You don't need to have public hearings where you're designing by committee. But we do think that those type of rules should apply if you're going to build a new town, say, like around Silverwood, where they have sewer capacity in that. If you're going to do a whole big new thing, then it should be a very public process. You should master plan it. And we have a district just for that. But we wouldn't anticipate residential neighborhoods having to come in as PUDs anymore. Create that flexibility in the code itself and do a good design that makes sense and, and go forth and do good with the art sense of it. More gratuitous animation. Love PowerPoint now. It's, it's kind of so good. In any case, when we talk about uh, development options, there are certain areas of the county where if you have one unit per 40 acre or one unit per 20 or one unit per 10 acre density, you might not want to do one unit per 10 acres as 10 acre lots. And in fact, the landscape may be better off if you don't. Maybe you want to put the four houses kind of right next to each other and have the rest like a protected hillside or something like that. You can do that under the code. You can do, if you have enough land, a hamlet or a village, and we wouldn't, they wouldn't be designed like this. I'm not that good of an artist. But it gives you the sense of proportion. Small lots, almost a square mile of land preserved. The same density as if you were to cut this whole thing up with individual lots, but a whole lot cheaper to build, and frankly, those lots will be worth more as residential lots with this big amenity than they would be if you cut this landscape apart. At the end of the day, the research shows that that project is going to have a greater residual value, greater resale value, and it's also going to be cheaper to build uh, because your road distances are much, much shorter. Your cut and fills are much, much less, and you have a chance to protect an entire range of stuff as agriculture, as whatever it is, recreation is made. So the open space you may not build on, or can you, if it's your land? Okay, now, th there's been some misunderstanding out in the community about open space. That's what I'm asking. That. So what I want to make sure that everybody knows is on an individual residential lot, there, we have changed the language so people can understand it better, just to clarify it. And basically what it says is there's a lot cover, like a certain percentage of the lot that you would cover with buildings and pavement. And what we did to determine that is we looked at what's on the ground now, and then we added a bunch of bunch of lot cover to that. And basically what it means is you can build a house and a driveway and a tennis court and a this and a that. And when you cover more than, say, I think it's 12% of 10 acres. Don't quote me because we can look at the actual code. I'm trying to remember a lot of sections. Um, when you get to a certain level, then you stop covering that lot with impervious surfaces. With the rest of it, grass, gardens, trees, whatever you're into, you know, the idea is not protecting open space for the public. It's where does the water go? Are you paving over 10 acres with concrete and the water's going on to your neighbors? Um, that's an issue. But if you're not, then you know, it's really about impervious cover. The water goes down into the ground. And the, this, the environment around here is sensitive to that. And so basically what so the research shows is that at a certain point of cover in a watershed, the watershed tends to decline in terms of its overall health. And so if everybody's stuck at 12% you know, of 10 acres, do the math on that. That is a whole lot of square feet. Yeah. Um, that is very, very generous. And in fact, some of our, our technical committee members said, well, if it's that big, do we really even care at all? And the answer is, well, if you really want to go over that, shouldn't there be some kind of uh, you know, review? And we have ways to actually go over that in the code as well. Um, and, and I guess the answer from the technical committee was, OK, you know, let's try that. Uh, and by technical committee, I mean, there's a group of people that are working with us that are sort of taking things apart at a very detailed level from a lot of perspectives to make sure that they work. Um, but in any case, this provides a whole lot more flexibility than there is in your current code. But this flexibility really is for very large landowners. Individual lot owners aren't going to have to worry about that. In this context, what open space means is stuff that's not going to be residential lots. But in individual lots, we don't 
talk about open space. We don't have an open space requirement for that. It's how much cover are you going to put on your own residential lot? Question? I noticed that in one of the things that you have established neighborhood, that was a natural crossing for the elk and everything, and, and there was just some shenanigans with the old commissioners, how it got voted in. But on that one, basically, they, they come in and they paved all these roads. They have two houses there. And if it had been two owners, there would have been two driveways, and it, and it still would have been all land, you know, covered land. Just two driveways versus all these roads for, for these developed planners. And I mean, I, to me, that is pathetic. And I'm not really happy with the, that type of thing. Let's cluster the houses together, build all these roads. You think you're, you're against the clustering idea? Absolutely. Okay. Well, there are certain areas of the county where, you know, if you did something like this, you could build away from the elk crossings and have those as not just amenities for elk, but for people who want to you know, use that space to watch elk or shoot elk or whatever. Um, you know, that's, that would be an optional way to do it. And in fact, the standards would encourage designs that are sensitive to where those crossings are. Well, actually, the sheriff's also said that um, we had to do the name of the watch. They said that's a hot point now because there's these roads and nobody goes there. So you're going to have more criminals going up there and partying and kids and stuff. The, the crash took a bunch of subdivisions out. In fact, the county was kind of lucky. Because there are some counties that have yet this. I saw this presentation from their planners. 400 years of inventory as a result of the crash. It completely oversubdivided all empty roads. So that unfinished in some cases. Not in this county, in other counties. This county is very lucky. But my concern, too, is now you can allow these subdivisions and these things, wide open space, but Grandma and Grandpa, who saved all their lives for 10 acres out there, they can't build on it. No, no, we don't be able to build. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Stay with us. Let's get through the presentation. We'll talk about Post districts. I want to describe to you what the districts do, and then we'll bring up the map, and we can talk about where Grandma and Grandpa want to live. We want to make sure we get the map right. Uh, are we good on that? What did Grandma and Grandpa okay, have to do so, with this? Scenic is a lot, like I said, a publicly owned conservation area. So if anybody owns land right now out in the country, we're not going to zone your land too. That's just not happening. We're looking at the ownership of the county records, and we're saying, okay, that's BLM, that's Forest Service. Those, those are scenic. If we mess any of this stuff because the records are out of date or whatever, we'll change it. We want to get this right. Working lands is applied to areas that are currently in agriculture, forestry, mining, and very low residential density uh, use. One unit per 40 acres in the dark green, one unit per 20 acres in the lighter green. If you have a lot in those districts that's smaller, the, the code very, very directly says you can build your house on it. So there's not going to be any conflict. If your lot is not this size, it's not an issue under the code. You can build at least one house. If you have 80 acres in a 40 district, you can build two houses. If it's in the 20, you can build four houses on that. And that's going to be consistent with what's generally speaking around that property in terms of the landscape. If we got it wrong in a better, a different future, not a better one, it's just different. People want different things. Is desirable for that area from the people that we talked to? We'll change it. We'll get countryside transitions from working land to residential. These are the areas that are kind of in agriculture, kind of in residential use, but that you really don't expect explosives manufacturing and storage or gun ranges or things like that to be right next to your, your house. Uh, and so these are typically mostly residential, but there's a lot of people that have six acres with a house in the forest um, that they have in the tax exam. Taxes are different, but this is, is typical of this area of the countryside. There's a lot of areas up around Apple that are one for 10 uh, you know, under roads and whatnot. This is the district for that. When we talk about niche residential products, if you're a developer, you might say, well, I want to build a community around an airstrip. This would be the district for something like that. It would allow that. Uh, I want to build a community for people who want to have horses. And we'll build a corral in the center and some riding trails through and around it. This would be a great district for that. That's what people expect. And it would create a space in which that type of development would thrive because the things that are around it are comparable in character. Small farms, forestry exemption, small scale mining. Small scale mining would be, you know, right now the highway districts own five to eight, ten acre parcels around roads, and they pull gravel out of them to do road surfacing and, and road beds and that. It'd be that kind of stuff, not you know, hardcore blasting and digging and that kind of stuff. Estate residential, one unit for five acres, more units per acre for clusters, hamlets, villages. We showed those options. We're still working through whether there should be a density incentive or whether the landscape itself provides that incentive, but that's what we're talking about. 
And again, those are sort of niche residential products potentially, where you could just break it into five acre lots if that's what you want to do. But as a developer, you have those choices. And in large measure, right now, the choices are restricted to either a conservation subdivision, which has certain parameters, or five acre lots right now. And in some cases, I think you have to go conservation. This would give you more options. Suburban residential is for new residential neighborhoods at three units per acre. It's suburbia. There aren't a lot of places in the county where suburbia is appropriate because there aren't any services, but there are certain lakeshore areas where you can get enough value together to actually build the sewer plant. Uh, and so Gaza Ranch is an example of a place that's pretty dense that has its own water and sewer system for that area. Um, this is the type of thing that we would be talking about for suburban residential. The district that I told you I would come back to we might build up a two-acre district in the code. Some people have asked us about that. We're looking at that very carefully. So the ideas that you bring to us, we take very seriously, and, and we want to work with you to make the better code. Is it your code? It's your code. I go back and subject to a different code, a code that I, in fact, wrote because I wrote the code for the city that I live in. But um, it's a different code. This applies to existing five and subdivisions with lots of about five acres less in the established neighborhoods. So there are established neighborhoods, residential neighborhoods in the R district right now, where you can have blasting next door or whatever, that people don't expect that, right? Those neighborhoods with existing houses on five acres or less, established neighborhoods. There are nine general types of established neighborhoods. When you look at the parcel map, and you look at where the buildings are and where people live, there are about nine different flavors of that in terms of how they pattern out. And each of those is gonna have different um, characteristics and so you can't create one set of blanket regulations for that that keeps that neighborhood intact. You have to really get down into the, the grain of it a little bit. So we created a bunch of options in those that they don't currently have. And by, let me just um, explain to you what that is. This is a house uh, that I drew up in the 3D program, but it's kind of like a house in Hayden um, that exists today. It's got a driveway in the front and an alley in the back, and it's really tight on all the lot lines. It might be because the aerial's a little off, but I think that this is a likely scenario in some places, right? The house is kind of built wherever on the lot, and nobody really inspected or cared when that was done. And it's not a big deal, because the neighborhood knows this beautiful town. And nobody's offended by it. People appreciate it. So under the established neighborhood, under the current zone, this would be called non-conforming. And if it burned down, you could rebuild it for a while, and then after a while passes, you have to build within whatever the setbacks are. Okay, under, under today's zone. Um, we don't think if you have a building that everybody thinks is cool in your neighborhood, that you should be non-conforming in any respect. So under established neighborhood, however big your buildable lot is, is fine. There are no non-conforming properties in established neighborhood. The premise is what you got today is fine. So we have standards for lot size that apply if you want to make new lots from bigger lots. But we don't have any standard that says a small lot in a lot of areas, in an area with bigger lots, is a bad thing. It's okay. So you can rebuild that to infinity where it is now under this new district. Big change and big important deal for property owners. Let's say something terrible happens to your house and you have to fight with an insurance company for four years. Well, in the meantime, you can't rebuild your house under county code now because it's too late. Then you get a cash you want to rebuild your house. You really like the floor plan and the structure. Under the new district, go to town, fine, where it was. Or you can build it like today within the setback if you want to, you want to build a different house. Or if that's not working because there's something over here that you can't build over or there's some muck under here or whatever, you can look at some options that are in the code to push the envelope in different directions. And that's okay too. <laughs> and these options have little standards just to make sure that it doesn't hurt your neighbor, that you're not building a bay window right where your neighbor's bathroom right on top of their backyard or something like that. Just to be, you know, good neighbors. Easy standards. And beyond that, if that doesn't work, you can go to a hearing examiner and say, these general criteria are met. I want my permit. So you don't have to get a variance for any of this. Under current code all over the country, this requires a variance today, including Cuban County. You wouldn't have to get a variance, and in most cases, you wouldn't have to even have a full hearing. Ms. Can you describe that? Push the envelope. What is the arrow? Uh, this is just a generic diagram, but basically what it means is if I need to do something more like this, but not exactly where the building was, there are ways that I can do that outside of this box. So we got numbers where if I can say the building fits in here, I don't have to prove anything else. 
I just give my application and get my building permit. I'm done. But if I can't do this or don't want to, then I can do something else. But maybe I have to make sure there's not a window in a certain location. Or maybe I have to make sure I have a fence to make sure that that window isn't really making my neighbor crazy. But that's it. It's easy. And you can read those standards. We posted them online. KCCode.com. Click on Code Drafts. You can go and check it out. It's in Article 3. So from what you're saying, I can, in an established neighborhood, I can build anywhere I want, and there's basically no rules and no setbacks. No. There are setbacks if you want to do that. You can build where you were, or you can follow rules that, you know, we haven't, we've got them in the code. You can read them. But it's beyond the scope of sort of the summary presentation today. I can break them out if you want to. We can talk about it. But that's what we're talking about here. Standards-based decision-making. Right now, if you want to do this, you go and prove a hardship for to get a variance. Those rules are published. They've been published for like a month. They're online. You can read them. They're there. So I'm straightforward. We're adding to them to make it more flexible. But yeah, they're also there. I have a question here. Now, in established neighborhoods, you're saying, OK, your house burns down four years later. You don't have a problem. You won't have a problem building, correct? That's right. Well, what about everybody else that's zoned everywhere else? Are they going to have difficulty rebuilding their house on five acres four years later because it's now zoned for 20 or 40 acres? <clears throat> Probably not. I'll get into that with you. Let me move on through this. The idea is on larger parcels, you almost never have a setback problem because you almost never have an encroachment in the first instance. There's enough space to work with. And the setbacks aren't really too restrictive uh, in those areas, so it's probably not going to end up being a big deal. In well, I mean, like for me, I know our driveway is a driveway from hell kind of getting up winter and damn winter, and it was built on steep things. So if we had an issue up there in a forest fire and our houses burned down and we had problems rebuilding right away, I mean, would we now all of a sudden be told no? No. Not in this district. Even no, in we're not district. in this district. Well, first of all, let's let's find out whether you are or should be in an established neighborhood. But beyond that, we can resolve that issue when we get to the map. For you, personally, we can make it personal for you today because we have the maps with us. We like to do that. We want to solve problems and not just make problems up. So we'll work with you on that, for sure. Next slide. So these are the basic neighborhoods that we've seen. These are neighborhoods that are on the ground today. You're familiar with them. Some of you live in them. Five acre, 330 foot wide lots. It's a very prevalent pattern in a lot of areas of the county. We said for new lots, if you have 10 or 20 or 30 acres and you want to do new lots because everybody around you is five, if they're at least 300 feet, it's close enough. It's a plus or minus 10%. You can do it. If you have 600 feet of frontage and 10 acres, you can do two lots. You know, no restriction to be exactly 330 in that circumstance. Two acres. Same frontage is, is what we've experienced in the landscape. They're usually 330 feet, uh, but not always. So it's a 300 foot, two acre. If you can build those two lots in an established neighborhood based on what you have now, you can subdivide that. But for the most part, in established neighborhoods, the, the rule is, among neighbors, we expect it to be what it is. It's a platted subdivision in many cases. It is what it is. Now, there is some opportunity here for some further stuff. We're not getting in the way of covenants if you have covenants. And we've got issues, I think maybe your question might be coming up about, well, what about the road and this and that? And we want to talk to you about it. private road, if you had a private road going to paved corridors or Ohio Mountain to Chilton from where we live, right. that doesn't, that, that regulation doesn't come into effect because we're on a private road. We're working on that. <clears throat> we, 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 we have more work. That's really complicated. we got private water systems, too. Right. And we need to deal with that. So we're saying this is where it is now for well and septic for, for water system use. And also, there's some issues. We, we want to try to make that a little easier, but we need to have some limits on it. Because if you double the density on a dirt road in a dirt road that's having trouble now, that could be problematic. So we just want to work through it. And we want to talk to you about that personally, because we know you have some experience that you can help us with. I mean, shared driveway. Pardon me? Off of a shared driveway. It's a smaller. Yeah. Go ahead. No, it's a private road. <laughs> so, are you suggesting that the this requirement will change with the new code? We're working through that issue. We actually thought along Lakeshore's we'd like to get it to six. We have some conversations with emergency managers. They have an argument to the contrary, and we're working with them. We need to have more discussions to figure out what all the issues are from the other down. We think particularly along Lake Shores, if we can negotiate with them and get a little more units on here, we can actually save property owners some money and actually make the roads work better. 
uh, in some of these areas that are constrained, and also protect water quality against unnecessary expenses of payment. We would like to do that, but we are taking seriously when the emergency managers tell us what they tell us, and we're going to work through the issues with scenarios to make sure that we figure out what they are, and then we're going to nail down as much flexibility as we can. That's what we're trying to do. So that could change. Then. It could change. And if it changes, it would be more. It's, nobody has an inclination to make it less. Does that, I hope that helps. We're going to try. We, we have a guarantee at this point that we can get to it because we have other jurisdictions that we have to respect that have different perspectives and we need to work with them instead of against them. Because some of these jurisdictions can still shut you down. So if the county says six is okay and the fire district says only four, you're going to get the least of those. Um, so they have that ability to do that. <laughs> commercial in the new code would be like commercial in the old code. How many have commercial property in the county? Okay, so you might know like the landscaping requirements are pretty onerous. The parking requirements are pretty ambiguous. Um, you actually have to plant a huge amount of trees right next to your building, and then a huge amount of trees between your building and the street. Now, if you're a retail business, for example, you want people to see your windows from the street if you can, or at least your sign, your building. You need to have your building be part of that identity. The current landscaping regulations just do not make sense in this regard, and they create a fire hazard for your building, too, in a place where fire hazards are really important consideration. So, We've completely overhauled the landscaping requirements. We've published them. We invite you to go look at them. They make a lot more sense, and they're pretty flexible, too. Um, we got slightly more flexibility with respect to mixed use. Anybody ever try to build a residential over retail buildings? The building codes are a little tighter than residential next to retail. So this code would allow for residential next to retail, um, which is going to be a little bit cheaper to build, but have that same intention of having residences near workplaces. So there's some more flexibility there and more clarity on parking. Right now, the district has some parking requirements, and the supplemental standards part of the code has some other parking requirements, and they don't necessarily line up with the list of uses. So you have to figure out, okay, what's the use, and then you have to figure out what's the closest thing for parking. And everybody pulls their hair out trying to figure out how many parking spaces. And for those of you who don't know, that's a huge consequence because a parking space might cost you six thousand bucks, and you don't want to build unnecessary parking spaces. Industrial combines the industrial districts that we have in the one district. If you have a heavy industry, it would have performance standards attached to it, kind of like what's in there now, uh, to make sure that heavy industries aren't delivering unfair blows to their neighbors. District boundary buffer guards would be required, which means if you have a big expanse in an industrial district, on the edge of the district itself, on the properties that are on the edge of the district, on those property lines, they would build maybe a berm, a landscape, something to prevent the impacts from spilling over onto residential. Like a PUD, which is a planned unit development, again, Gaza, Black Rock, things like that. Uh, the planned unit, planned regional destination would be like that in terms of how it unfolds, but it'd be a truly mixed use development on a very large scale. This would be like building a new town around Silverwood or the Curling Casino. It would only be in very limited circumstances with very large projects and very large landowners with engineering teams and public participation in that to make sure that we can fit and be placed into this place. Um, so that would be a very public process. It's focused much more on process. Um, there's some just basic standards in for, um, for design and for density and for the amount of uh, floor area for non-residential uses. And beyond that, the designers can shuffle it around and make it work. And that goes through a very, very public process to make sure that people have their input. It leverages regional attractions that have available water, wastewater, and access. And uh, that would be like Silverwood Casino. But if somebody comes in with a big manufacturing plants or something that generates a lot of jobs and they want to have workforce housing and retail things around that and they create a sufficient center of gravity they could theoretically do that too. It could be applied at the request of the landowner who brings in that master plan. We don't have anything on our map zone planned regional destinations. It's just available to somebody who wants to do something on a very big scale and has a sophisticated team that can come in and deliver that. So it's just a way of doing it. We have some questions here. Um, I think many of you probably have questions about what's going on in my neighborhood. Um, not my neighborhood. Um, and we have the maps, and we can show you on screen. So if you have questions about your particular property, we can start there. If you have any general questions, we can do those. I'd rather get to the maps because it's very interesting, and we want to make sure we get this right. But if you have a general question. Yeah, just, uh, so to sum up everything I just heard, you're trying to protect what we already own. Yes, sir. And well, by giving us an appropriate definition of what we are to 
some extent, yes. In the rural environment, in this district, yes. Does it apply to residential Yeah, we had this question earlier today. I think it's a good question. If you have an existing conditional use, you will continue to have that existing conditional use right under the new code. It wouldn't carry over to you. And if it becomes non-conforming, we'll have a process to make it even conforming. So if you have finance at the time or whatever, it'd be easy to do. We're going to make that easy to do. We need to modernize the code, but we need to respect people that are operating under conditional use permits and the rights that they have attached to those permits, and we will continue. Um, that's going to be coming in the procedures section because it's it's much less related to the standards of the new code than carrying forward something the county said it was going to do. I think it's a good, it's an important trust between the county and the property owner when they grant the permit to, to live by what they granted in that permit. So yes, uh, on both, I think, counts. Is that fair? Yes. Correct me if I'm wrong, but have you not, in meeting with the cities, have, the, have you not said that the county wanting to work with the city will not allow development in the county that would affect the city's growing? So, the, so development would be allowed in the county according to what works for the city? Yeah, to the city's water and wastewater. We think that's very important. Um, we'll show you that. So between um, Post Falls and what a zero in uh, in this there. area right here. This is, a, I it's think, zone working you've got a very important point. It's yeah. zone, right now, on the, on these maps, it's zone working land. Mostly working land large. large, which is what it is. Working land what? Large. Correct. So, 40 acres. So the people there who have been working and want to sell off five-acre parcels, because that's what they've been planning for, they are, in fact, some of the losers in this scenario. They only have 15, they can't, they can only put one unit. 15 acres? These are 160 acre tracks here. No. She's these are tens, but these are all owned by Rapid. These are. Well, I, I know, I can tell you two people right now that own 15 that have wanted to divide into five and haven't been able to. Okay, if they're in yellow. No, it's not in yellow, it's in the working mm -hmm. lands, large. So, so in fact, they're, technically, they're losers. Let me, say, let me say, today, there is an area of city impact agreement, which is I understand all that. So well, no, you understand, but I think the roof needs to understand, so I'm going to go there. And that is, in this space, this is all in the area of city impact of these cities. <laughs> and there's an agreement with the cities that nobody is allowed to subdivide in this area today. So if you have any land in here today, you're not allowed to subdivide. And so in fact, you hear from a woman who has 10 acres here. That can't subdivide this, which is never going to be part of the city of Post Falls, because that agreement has that blanket provision in it. Okay. So you can't do it right I, now. Actually, you can't. Don't, but, Todd. I would like to ask, ask you my question. You can't. You can go through an application up. process and have it rezoned because several plain people around our area have done that, and then you, you can't can subdivide it. If you rezone it to rural, you can. In the ACI. See, this is the problem with the code as it stands today. No. There, no, no, there is a provision not in the code, but in the ACI agreement that says no subdivision. You have to you consult 30 different ordinances to get this, but one of them says that. No subdivision here. I've That's been working with months, and if we rezoned it to rural, they could then go and divide it into but five. But you can't rezone it to rural without the city's consent. Exactly. I'm, I'm not arguing that. Okay. But it's there, a is, there is a way to do it. Under the new code, we're working with the cities to make sure that people out here can subdivide. To 20. To create either uh, 40. one unit per 40 acres, or in some cases one unit to 20 acres, or in these cases one unit to 5 acres. So you've answered my question that in, in those situations, people who live there happen to be the losers when you say some win and some lose. So that's, that's been They're losing question. now. They're losing now. No, because and no, what, what we're saying is, it. eventually, the cities are going to come out here, and they're going to be able to develop four or five units per acre. And that'll be great benefit to them. Well, they might uh, be dead. Let me see if I can help. It's the future. I, I think you're correct. But we have a code which, um, a state residential, that they could try and get a zone change to in the new code. And it's just as least likely to happen then as it is today. Well, it happened yeah. several times. I, I, this, if you look on the map here, there's several yellow gold sections. 20 acres that were divided into 10s or 10s into 5s or whatnot in this area. So 
They were able to do that. Before the agreements happened. When did those agreements happen? They happened in the 90s, yeah. No, no, they, no, no, they were in the 2000s. 2003 or 2004. Yeah, right? the ACI, they were in like, the maybe in 2005. The shared sharing yeah. system care was two. So those happened in 2005, and, and there hasn't been, there's so been a, been solved since then? That's correct. I, I mean, and we're working right now to fix it. But the my point help. is, the county has told the city that we won't let development happen in the county unless you agree to it. Which yeah. No, what we said is that we're not going to allow subdivision, not development, because they can build a house, so it's subdivision. Okay, now, these, are, these are the county properties, correct? Not yes. the city. Yes. That's correct. So what, what input, and I mean, I don't even know that this really happened, so I'm kind of going, wait a second, let's backtrack. <coughs> I've lived here since then. Where was our input from the county? Where was our input from the people that live there? And I don't really want the city controlling what we do. That's why we don't want to live in the city. That's why it's so important that we renegotiate the ACI agreements and that we, we make them, we change what's happening today because those are agreements that previous board has signed and that they're, they're law. Let me, let me just explain to you what ACI does. It's really important. And you can it's all with 67, 65. What, what the ACI agreement does, were you still going on? I'm sorry, I thought you were talking. No. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Commissioner. It says that the cities and the counties must form an agreement about what's going to happen in the area around the city. And when they do, that the law of that area in terms of zoning is fixed until they both agree otherwise. And so the cities yeah. are willing to talk about what otherwise is now, and they haven't done that yet. Excuse me. I'm in what is called the impact area. I'm on what is known as the four corners. One side is Hayden, one side is Grafton, one side is Close Falls, and I'm on Porter Lane and I'm on Cutter Road. We have 10 acre parcels there. We're in the county. In here? In here? Well, wherever Cutter Road is, I can't see your map. We're right off the prairie. Hutter's to the right of that map, right. I think. No. Further east. Okay, we have 10 acres there, and we're on the four corners. It's called what is called the four corners. Okay. So we have 10 acres now. We're in what is called the impact area where we really can't subdivide right now. Right. Right across the street, we have the landings, which is Coeur d'Alene, which they have put in the main store. Okay. On the other side of Prairie, they're planning a big subdivision with a uh, soccer court or whatever, that's on the Hayden side, okay? So my question is, how is this going to impact us with our 10 acre parcels along Cutter Road there? Are we going to be able to subdivide that property this. into one quarter acre lots? If you come into the city, yes, because you can get water and sewer. Under the current regulations from Panhandle Health District, you can't get uh, over the aquifer, you can't go smaller than five acres. That's right. Unless you can cluster it in a way that we've negotiated, but that would probably require more land. So basically what I'm saying is, under if, if everything goes well with these negotiations, um, and if we get this zoning that we're talking about here, you'd be able to at least split it five. In, in two fives. And if you go into the city, then you could tour it, which means you could do whatever the city would let you do. Right, I see it. Yeah, so all this area tends the future of that area, if the cities agree to renegotiate, and the cities are, as we understand it, pretty much okay with this map, um, then you'd be able to cut these into fives. But right now, you, I, my understanding is you can't. That's right. Yeah, so we think it's really not a big deal here. The city's not going to come and annex you unless you want them to. Well, my, my concern is, is that, you know, we use our 10 acres, okay, and we have this thing about the so when you are look you at something like, is this yours in here? Right here? Yes. This one? Not on the corner. Yes. If you have much less than 10% cover on this lot right now, and I think we had 12%, I'd have to look at it. It's 10%. 10%. 10%. Okay. But still, 10% of 435,060 square feet is a lot of square feet. You've got an acre of impervious cover that you can right now. You have less than an acre. I live on 10 acres. 
Yes. If I want to put a, a chicken coop or my neighborhood, we don't have problems like that. No, you can do that. All day long. Sure. A chicken coop is in you know, the problem. Or I want to build another building on there. Yeah, you have plenty of room to build another building on there now. But are you going to stop me from doing it on the rest of my acres once this goes in because I'm over my 10% usage? No. No, there's going to be standards for improving beyond that, too. It's, really, not, it's, all about it's not usage. It's 10% impervious cover, which means that the water can't go through the ground. So it's not usage. You can have a, a, a motor cross track that drains, and that's okay. But it's the, it's the impervious cover, so it's paved over or buildings on it that is a, you would have like an acre of that. And you'd have nine acres of whatever you want, gardens and trees and grass and pasture, or whatever you're doing. Who are you people to tell us what yeah. we should do with our property? Oh, we yeah. pay the taxes on it. Hey, Amen. You know, we pay the mortgages on it. You know. If you look at this landscape, man, nobody has more than even close to 10%. It of doesn't matter. We do what we want to do. If someone wants to have a gun thing next to me, I don't care. I've got a neighbor who's a cop who shoots all the time. Do I care? No. That's your, your, that's good input. And for us to figure out where the appropriate balances are, we respect your opinion. But you're taking that away from us. You're I'm, taking away our freedoms. What I'm doing Amen. is proposing a code that I think reaches the balance of interest of people that we talk to. Now, if we get that balance wrong, tell me oh, we've, been out, hey, e. we've heard some very vocal people who tell us things again and again and to bring friends, but we've heard a lot of people that don't speak up at meetings when people are shopping that say otherwise. We've heard a lot of people that have had neighbors that have massive impacts on them that it's really borders on really unfair. Well, I do. I have the landings right across the street from me, 1,500 homes that destroy a beautiful piece of property that they burn grass. We didn't care if they burn grass. But some liberal have a problem. Everybody has a problem somewhere in the landscape. Um, and we have had people that are opponents to regulation on one day and opposing a project on the other day. We, we see that all the time. It just depends on what day it is and what's happening but in the neighborhood. But we live in the county, sir. We're not in the city. We yeah. left the city. Uh, pretty close to the city, but I understand. I understand. I understand where you're coming from. No, you don't. The landscape. We, we have a guy on our committee who said, look, we're in the county where if you throw elbows and you hit somebody, that's okay. I would submit to you today that there's a rural designation with you know explosives manufacturing and all this other stuff available to people who live in a five acre lot neighborhood is a little much for a lot of people to tolerate. Who? We have well, I mean you can go down to areas Micah Flats, for example, had a big combat over self storage, let alone explosives manufacturing. We've got combat going on right now. You can read the papers about a pavement plan. We've got blasting in a mine and rock crushing yeah, that destroyed this man's right. life for, for weeks. Right. 24 yeah. hours a day. Yeah. 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 Two months. How cool is that? So what we need to do is figure out where the balance is. If you want to shoot on your own property, fine. Nobody's going to stop you from using your property for things that you're allowed to do. Nobody's getting into your second amendment yes, rights in the code. A, no, no, no. A gun range on your property where the public comes in and pays you to shoot on your property is a bigger impact than you taking your own handgun and shooting a target in your backyard. There's a huge difference between those two enterprises. In fact, if the gun range isn't properly designed, and maybe Mr. Kramer can speak to this, um, there's a whole bunch of lead that's going to be there in the soil, too. And how fair is that when that lead runs off into your neighbor's agricultural operation? You probably wouldn't appreciate that too terribly much. Those things need to be looked at. Just looked at. Well, the silver valley. That's the best illustration of all. That is the best illustration. You look at the silver valley and what it's attacking. Then it went to Bullen, and the EPA has just massive restoration of that whole valley. It's affected everybody all the way to the little Spokane River west, west Spokane. People don't realize what she just said, but you got to have standards and you got to have regulations. Otherwise, you know, my neighbor here is going to have a pig farm in his front yard, you know? But that would be okay. It's but that's okay. It's residential. But no, the point is, <clears throat> Silver Valley is a classic example. They went in there and they restored all them homes that were contaminated for years from the mines. 
the bunker, the sunshine, all the, you know, that's a classic example of what the government had to do to clean that mess up. So we're going to do this out of the valley? The county to county neighboring impacts that's the right. valley. So the do the problem the of the right. Think about it. 77 million metric tons of contaminated sediments from the Silver Valley are in the bottom of Coeur d'Alene Lake. Well, they're all the way in the little Spokane River. 77 million metric tons. We live in an area that is full of ore. Yes, ma'am. Okay. We've got iron here. We've got copper here. That is what our mountains are made from. Do you think Mother Nature has nothing to do with it putting in our water? The world benefited from that. Let's get back to the map and see if there's anybody that has any issues on the map. We would really like to talk about your property and your neighborhoods. So we did that here, and what we can say is today the code and the agreements with the city say you can't subdivide. Tomorrow, if the cities and we hope that they're on board with us, um, this could be two fives, which is with your sanitary restrictions we can't handle. If you annex, you can do quarter acre lots or whatever you can get for cities only. That's not in the county's control. This is what you think that's great. Questions, Question, sir, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, the property I've got out now is known as the water pit. Uh, okay, Hauser, can we, how do you know Hauser is north and west? Here no. Is, uh, south and west. Yeah. Yep. So let's get over there. We need to get past the prairie brick building that has to something here. Okay. Hauser? Can you see this thing? Got it. Stay tough. Oh, that's... This. Yeah, I've got the other 40 acres in that. Yep. Okay. So, um, 